story we're going to tell you about George and Peggy Bates might be the story of any married couple in this audience. Begin one Sunday night in the Bates' sitting room. Here is Peggy Bates, about to tidy up the Sunday papers her husband has read and flung down. Her yawn suggests she's either tired or bored. Actually, she is both. Here is George Bates, sitting at the bureau, and that's tomorrow's work that he's looking over. As his wife reaches over him to collect a brimming ashtray, his gesture of impatience suggests that he's either very bad-tempered or lacking in affection. Actually, he's neither. He demands to know why on earth she has to start housework at this time on a Sunday evening. She informs him she's merely putting things straight for the morning. Anyway, if he can bury himself in Monday's work on a Sunday evening, surely she can pick up the Sunday papers he's thrown all over the place. What does he expect her to do? Sit and look at him? Natter, 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 thinks George, what she's starting all this for. But aloud, he remarks, but what is there to do on a Sunday evening except work? They never seem to have friends in as they used to. At one time, she used to make little bits and pieces to eat and brew some coffee, and they had some wonderful Sunday evenings. Does he imagine that bits and pieces, as he calls them, can be made out of nothing? Is he aware of the time a woman can spend going from shop to shop looking for little delicacies? She hasn't got time to do the things, cook the things, clear up the things that she used to. She hasn't got time, does he hear? She hasn't got time. George replies, there's not the slightest need to shout. It's a pity you've never learned to state a case quietly without shouting. As it's impossible to work in peace in my own house on Sunday evening, I shall go to bed. So shall I, says Peggy, when I've done the washing up. If she wants me to help wash up, thinks George, she's only got to ask. And now it's Monday, and the Monday routine begins. The rush from the house, the morning peck. Goodbye, goodbye. The rush for the bus, the train tearing up to town. And here's George, sitting in his compartment, looking thoughtful. What are today's appointments? Let's have a look at the diary. Hello, what's this? H.M. coming three o'clock. A second thought tells him what's happened. This is Peggy's diary. He must have picked it up from the bureau last night in exchange for his own. But who the devil's H.M.? Oh, one of her women friends, no doubt. Yes, that's what it must be. H.M., H.M., she hasn't got a woman friend called H.M. Oh, well, it must be somebody he hasn't heard about. Dismissing it from his mind, he opens his paper. Suddenly, a headline hits him right bang in the eyes. Husband never knew other man existed. Another man? A dozen wild thoughts chase themselves through George's mind. It couldn't. It's not possible. It's fantastic. As the train rushes him towards his work, let's review the life of George and Peggy, because this marriage is typical of millions of others today. Let's go back 20 years. Here's Peggy in her going away outfit. Here's the house they had just begun to buy. Here's the sitting room you've already seen, but 20 years ago it was new, and the furniture was new, and the carpet was new, and the hoover cleaner was new, and keeping house was... Goodbye, precious fun, even if George didn't earn a lot of money. Somebody at the back door. Switch off the hoover, Peggy, and see who it is. Aha, the butcher's boy. And what's he got for you? Hmm, just a teeny pre-war joint for a family of two. And don't forget the pork chop. Here, wait a minute, what about tomorrow? Bring me six large chops and... Aha! What was that? That is what we call hollow laughter, ladies, from the ghost of the past. And there was Mrs. Jolly, who came for a job. Eightpence an hour, Mum, though some ladies pay ninepence. Oh, yes, I'm a good, strong scrubber. I don't mind what I tackle. Ha, ha, ha! That was the ghost of the past again, thinking of the two and sixpence an hour Mrs. Jolly would ask today, and certainly get from the hundreds of ladies who would trample each other to death to obtain her services. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. You came back from shopping, the chops full of ham and chicken and real pork sausages. Uh-huh. And if you forgot some small item, madam, 
You'll simply pick up the telephone, go up through to the grocer, who listened respectfully to your request and said, But of course, madam, I'll send it round straight away. Here, Tom, hop on your bike with this packet of salt. Ha, ha, ha. Peggy had a lot to do, but she liked doing it. The hoover was constantly in her hand, and it helped make time for a game of tennis, or a cup of tea with her mother. She even joined a keep fit class in the first two years they were married. And even when a pram appeared outside the front door, and there was more washing and more sewing to do, there was still some pleasure left in those pre-war years as the hoover went humming merrily on. And through the war years, when George was in the Air Force, the hoover did a bigger job than ever. It swept the carpet the day the ceiling cracked after a near miss. And when the windows were blown in and powdered glass settled everywhere, what a useful job the cleaning tools did. But at last there was a more cheerful mess to clear up. Paper hats after George's Z-mob party, for instance. There were two now to send off to school in the morning. My word, chum, you're back on the job pretty quickly, and hasn't that rat coat died well? The war was over, and Peggy looked forward to having more time to spend with her children. George had got his old job back again with more money. Life would slip back into its old enjoyable routine. But somehow, the next five years slipped away, and the last five years of Peggy's thirties slipped with them. One morning when she was dusting the mantelpiece, she caught sight of herself in the mirror. I've worn pretty well on the hose, she thought, and so is the carpet, and so is the hoover. But although George is earning much more, it doesn't go as far, and I'm working harder than ever. We don't entertain so much, we quarrel more. In fact, I'm a darn sight worse off than when I was first married. And that brings us back to where we started. Here's George just coming back from lunch. He's been puzzling his brains all the morning about the mysterious HN. Two o'clock, and at three... George decides he can't stand it any longer. He picks up the phone. Get me Mr. Dean. Oh, Mr. Dean, this is Bates here. I'm not feeling well. A touch of flu, perhaps. I think I've turned it in this afternoon to go home. You don't die, do you? Thanks, yes. Oh, I shall be better tomorrow. <coughs> There's just time to catch the 220. Three o'clock. Well, HM is very prompt, for well, here he is. Yes, it's a he, as George suspected. Good afternoon, Mr. Sutton, says Peggy as she lets him in. Hello, is this not HM? Or is Mr. Sutton a pet name she has for him? Ah! Now we're beginning to understand. He's come to service the Hoover. There's nothing wrong with it, says Peggy. It's wonderful, really. We've had it 20 years. I should think that's a record, isn't it? But while he is examining the cleaner, Mr. Sutton tells her there are plenty of Hoover electric cleaners still functioning well after 20 years. But of course, there have been plenty of improvements since then. Has she ever examined a new model for herself? He's brought one along for her to have a look at. Peggy is so interested that she doesn't notice that George has arrived home in the middle of the afternoon and is tiptoeing furtively up the garden path. He seems very self-conscious, as though all the neighbours can see him. He seems to be very anxious not to make a noise as he lets himself in. Imagine you're going to catch your wife out, uh, catch her in. Hello? A man's voice in the sitting room? And what's Peggy saying? Of course, we've been married for 20 years, and 20 years is a long time. Nothing lasts forever, of course, but even after the newness of it all wore off, we've been such good friends, I hate to make a break. Oh dear, thinks George. Of course, goes on Peggy, he still picks up little bits of fluff, Never missed a bit of fluff in 20 years. Oh! All the same, says Peggy, I do agree it's about time I made a change. Naturally, I'll have to discuss it with my husband, so I should darn well
well think, mutters George. But the next moment she says something about putting the kettle on for a cup of tea and, good gracious, you gave me a start. What on earth are you doing home? Who's that in there, demands George. The Hoover man. But what are you doing home? H.M. The Hoover man, he echoes. But what are you doing home, repeats Peggy. Huh, I didn't feel well, but I feel better now. Good, says Peggy. Go and have a look at the new cleaner he's brought when I get some tea. Now in you go, says Peggy, and make yourself pleasant. Rather shaken, George says, How do you do? My name is Bates. Pleased to meet you. Do sit down. Thanks, but I have to work on the machine. Oh, have a cigarette? No thanks, you see, I don't smoke. Well, uh, do sit down. But I haven't quite finished. A light? No? Mind if I do? Have a chair. Later on, Mr. Sutton had finished his routine inspection, and George heard the story of the new Hoover. Peggy said, I want my husband to understand exactly how a Hoover works. I don't often have him at my mercy at this hour of the afternoon, do I, darling? And this is what Mr. Sutton told them. 90% of the dirt in every house settles in the carpet, and it's a free kind. Stubborn, clinging litter, such as bits of fluff or dog hairs, such as this kapok, which can't be removed without sweeping. Light dirt, such as this soda, easily removed by any vacuum cleaner. And embedded grit, brought in from the street on the soles of shoes, such as this sand. Have you ever seen grit magnified? Look at this and you'll see how sharp it is. It settles at the base of the carpet, and as successive feet press the tufts of the carpet against the razor-like edges of the grit, it literally cuts the carpet to pieces. This can only be removed by beating it out of the carpet. A cleaner working on the suction principle doesn't remove all kinds of dirt. I can easily show you that. Look, I've disconnected the belt, and it now acts merely as an ordinary vacuum cleaner. Try to pull this piece of paper away. You see how strong the suction is. Now let's see what happens to the dirt. It finds K-pop tough going. It takes up soda quite easily. Let's see what it does to the sand. We'll give it a thorough going over. Let the suction have a good opportunity of taking it out of the pile. But you'll find it's still there. Look, I'll tap it with this screwdriver. You see the sand being bounced out of the pile onto the surface of the carpet? Now let's represent the construction of the carpet by using a piece of paper as the backing and this loosely woven material as the pile. The dirt becomes embedded and eventually disappears into the base of the pile. To see what happens, let's reverse the procedure of cleaning. Instead of moving the cleaner over the carpet, we'll move the carpet over the cleaner. You see that suction alone won't remove this dirt. When tapped with a screwdriver, however, the dirt begins to disappear, showing that some form of beating is necessary. Now I'll reconnect the belt, and in doing so, I bring an entirely new principle into action, or rather two principles. First, notice the brushes and small bars. As the cylinder on which they're mounted, it's called an agitator, revolves, the brushes sweep up the grit that the bars tap-tap at the carpet to remove. I use this screwdriver to represent the surface of the carpet, and you'll see the hairs of the brush press against it. And as the bars come round, they give it a succession of light taps. We'll put down some more of the three kinds of dirt. The kapok, representing loose fluff, dog hairs, and so on. Soda, which represents light surface dust. And sand which represents grit. We'll brush it well in, as if it had been trodden in by successive layers of feet going over it. Now then, we put the hoover over it. But this time the brushes are at work, and the cape is taken up quite easily. Away goes the light dust, as it did before. And now for the sand. If you look very carefully, you'll see that as the suction raises the carpet and the beta bars begin tapping, the sand is actually visible. Look, bouncing about just in front of the cleaner. But as we draw it back, the sand has gone. Look, I'll tap it with the screwdriver again and you'll see it really has gone. Now let's do
do the upside down test again, but this time using all the principles of the Hoover. The dirt is removed instantly, showing the dirt and the Hoover can't stay in the same house. Just one more thing. I want you to notice how the Hoover raises the carpet onto a cushion of air to do the beating. It's a very soft and gentle action. But these beta bars, as they come round, deal firmly and surely with the dangerous, sharp pieces of embedded dirt. Away they go into the dust bag. Mr. Sutton finished by saying, it's so easy a child can use it. A child can use it, echoed Peggy. Well, you have a go then, George. Wait a minute, let me put some dirt down for you. There you are, darling, it's all yours. Jolly good, said George. Really, I don't know why we should change this. If it goes as well as this after 20 years, I can't imagine that your company has designed anything better. Peggy laughed her head off as Mr. Sutton gently informed George that the company hadn't. He had the new model in his hand, and this was his old one. And Mr. Sutton went on to say, This new model has the handball joined to the lower part of the machine instead of the aluminium yoke in the old one. This, combined with a new low motor, enables the Hoover cleaner to go under low-built pieces of furniture. But instead of a screw to adjust the cleaner to the thickness of the pile, it's done automatically. And this was the old way of fixing the cleaning tool. You had to take off a base plate, remove the belt, and fit in the nozzle attachment. But here is the new instantaneous method. You simply push in, and pull out. It saves you many minutes in the day's work. The dust bag is more easily emptied too in the new model. There's a quick release device and the bag is emptied through a rigid metal opening. Shake and it's empty. No mess, no soiling your fingers. It's all very easy. And finally the new model has the searchlight beam to spy out the dirt in dark places. You know how that sort of dirt gets overlooked unless you're careful. Meanwhile, George had been looking at an illustrated leaflet. I see you make another type of cleaner now, he said. Mr. Sutton told him all about it. Yes, model 402, a cylinder type cleaner. Suitable for homes that have a considerable area of linoleum to be cleaned and not much carpet. There's another model, the Junior, for small homes. And the Dustet, so useful for stairs upholstery and 101 different purposes. I like this new way of switching it on with a touch of the toe, said Peggy. Mr. Sutton agreed that it was very handy. Or shall we say it's very footy? Ha ha, said George. But tell me, why should anyone have a new cleaner when their old one is working as well as ours? And as Mr. Sutton glanced at the radio, he put it to George this way. Well, think of your radio set, Mr. Bates. Can you visualize what it would be like if you had your 1930 set standing there? It might still be working, but you wouldn't realize how out of date it was until you heard a modern one. And finally, he suggested that they kept model 612 overnight and gave it a good trial. That evening, George and Peggy give the room such a cleaning as it hasn't had in years. They clean under everything, and on top of everything, and behind everything, and between everything. Do you think we should be allowed anything on the old cleaner, says Peggy? I'm sure we should, says George, and I've no doubt they'd arrange higher purchase terms if we wished. There aren't many chances these days of keeping the house up to date. We can't afford new carpets, nor new chair covers, so it's vital to keep everything in as good condition as possible. There's another reason, too. I can't get a new wife. I have to make do with the old one I've got. Not so much of the old, says Peggy. And if giving her the best and latest piece of household cleaning equipment is going to save her even a little bit of time or give her just a little bit more zest in running the home, then I'm going to get it for her. That's very sweet of you, darling, says Peggy. They say a new hat gives a woman a new interest in life. Well, a new hoover certainly gives her a fresh interest in the home. Just look at this room. It makes me feel I want to ask somebody in. Mary and John, perhaps. Why not, says George. But can we offer them anything? I'll go and scrape round the kitchen, says Peggy. You ring them up and see if they're doing anything. It's ages since we saw them. As George goes to the phone, he shouts, I took your diary by mistake today. Like your cheek, comes Peggy's voice from the kitchen. There's all sorts of things in there not intended for your eyes. Good heavens, 
You don't think I read it, do you? gasped George. And I, said Peggy, had your diary. Who is H.C.? H.C., says George. Yes, says Peggy. Come, Keen. Who is H.C.? H.C., he informs her, is haircut. So that was all right. They got their H.C.s and H.M.s sorted out, minded their P's and Q's in future, and everything was okay. And there we leave George and Peggy. But ladies and gentlemen, for you are concerned in this too, this film is about time. Time saved by Hoover. Time for women to devote to leisure, to their children, to their husbands. It's about time. And whether you already have a Hoover that has given you years of service, or whether you ought to get one, when you catch sight of the name Hoover, remember, it's about 